Hello, everybody. My name is Robert Ryland. I'm an interventional cardiologist at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, and I've been asked to go over what to do if you lose your stent. These are my disclosures. So you can lose all sorts of stuff in the coronary, shown on the bottom of the slide. Lost stents is seen on Ivis on the left, balloon fragments, tips of laser catheters, roto, CSI burrs, all sorts of things. But thankfully, it's relatively rare. When we talk about stents uh, specifically, the best data out there is a meta-analysis from Balakis, where they um, put together a bunch of case series, case reports um, from 1991 to 2012. And again, relatively rare losing stents, and they did find that the incidence went down significantly over time, um, probably due to improvements in stent design. However, uh, only two out of three stents that were lost in the coronaries were retrieved with significant consequences in about one out of five patients. You can see everything from bypass surgery, MI, CVA, vascular access issues, all the way to mortality. So it's definitely a big deal when it occurs. So why is it a big deal? Obviously, it's a foreign body in the coronary that can lead to thrombosis, uh, dissection from either uh, what you did to lose it in the first place all the way to some of the methods we'll talk about uh, percutaneously for getting it out, ischemia and arrhythmias from being further blockage in the coronaries, and ultimately really an inability to revascularize the target vessel. You can see an example of having to go to surgery on the right side there for a strip uh, for a strip stent they weren't able to get out with the subsequent bypass surgery. So before we talk about ways to actually get the stent out, we really need to talk about ways to avoid this altogether. And it's really about anticipating risk uh, in the case, everything from tortuosity and angulations, things like circumflexes, heavy calcium or risk factors for that with CKD or age, uh, bifurcations obviously having to go through metal struts or post tabby for the same reason, and then post cabbage for the increased tortuosity and calcification. So how do we uh, mitigate some of these? Well, you know, there's been an increasing use in using guide extensions to navigate some of the torso wash and calcifications. There is a caveat to that. Obviously, there's a collar there um, that can catch gear, especially if you have a mismatch in the guide extension and the guide size. Um, you can also get wire wrap a little bit more easily when using more than one wire. So that's just something to keep in mind, depending on where you're catching and not able to advance your gear. Uh, poor vessel preparation is a big, big culprit for this. Obviously, uh, with the increase in calcification and tortuosity we're seeing in our cath labs, we've got to be meticulous in order to avoid that and obviously really avoiding direct stenting in the vast majority of cases. Um, we always try to uh, stent distally to approximately to avoid going through stents. That metal on metal is a big deal that can cause stent loss. And then you can actually move the proximal stent if you've gone through it and it hasn't had time to endothelialize. Uh, and then wire entrapment that we talked about. Sometimes realizing that'll happen even when not using extensions or other gear like that. Uh, and sometimes you have to take one of the wires out and re-advance it to solve that. So let's talk about some of these solutions if you do find yourself in a situation where you uh, lose your stent. And what we'll see in the algorithms that we're going to talk about in a minute, it's all about maintaining wire position because the treatments are very different depending on if you're able to have maintained wire position or not. So the first is if you've maintained wire position, trying to slip a small balloon through that stent, blow it up, and then bring that back uh, into the guide or guide extension. I will say I really like to use guide extensions where it all, wherever possible. You want the uh, length of coronary that you navigate to be as short as possible because as soon as you get into the guide or guide extension, you can do things like trapping and all these other things to get control of whatever you've lost. And you can see an example of using a small balloon to drag that back on the right. Here's an example of, hey, actually my stent's not in a bad location. It's sized one-to-one. -one. Maybe I'll just deploy it. Same idea, small balloons in order to get the stent um, starting to deploy and then serially increasing your balloon sizes to get that one-to-one -one match. If you've maintained wire position, and sometimes even if not, you can pass several wires distal to the stent. You're then gonna wanna use that sort of tapered floppy segment uh, that you typically radio opaque at the distal end of the wire. You can hook up the back ends of the wire outside of the guide to hemostat and start twirling. And the goal is to try and create a knot with those radio opaque segments. Once you've got a knot, you can start to pull it back and it'll catch on the distal end of the stent and actually pull that back to your guide or guide extension. And you can see an example of that kind of knot on the right side of your screen. Then there's all sorts of different things we can use to actually remove it. Uh, different types of gear, everything from gooseneck snares to end snares or tulip snares or biotomes. I'd say the most popular probably gooseneck, but I do like to use uh, the tulips uh, and we'll see an example of that as well. Um, if you know, you're not able to get it out in other ways and it's in a reasonable area. You can do a stent crush. So you just crush it with a balloon and then stent around it. I will say I have a partner who did that um, and had a patient who came in every um, handful of months with recurrent ACS at that site. And there was just recurrent instant thrombosis and restenosis at that site. And you can see the arrow there on the right side of the screen. I ended up having to uh, burr that little molehill of stent out. Uh, the patient was finally able to uh, 
not to be at home for longer than six months uh, before coming back in. So again, these are several different algorithms out there. Monos has a really good one that's getting ready to come out. This is one from Jacob Dahl and several of us from the Seattle Complications course. And again, it really um, starts with, do you have a wire through it or not? If so, can you deploy the stems at a reasonable area? If not, uh, going through several of the different treatment modalities we spoke about. These are some algorithms from PCR Online that I think are excellent. And really they divide it through, do you still have wire uh, on the left side or do you not have wire on the right side and going through several of the treatment modalities that we discussed. So let's talk about some cases uh, where we actually had some stent strip and what we did. So this is a partner's case where he was burring out this prox cert. Uh, you can see it was nasty angle. You can see heavily calcified, but he's able to finally get it. Does his proximal stent here, looks pretty reasonable. Takes his angiogram and he says, ah, actually, you know, I don't love that OM, I kind of want to stent it. Did not use a huge balloon to get the side strut open, but did take a rather large stent in order to take care of that OM. Um, you can see here, unfortunately, was not able to get it through and on pulling it back, the balloon snapped back, the stent is now off, the wire is off. So this is a problem. So this is when I got called in and we couldn't really get any goosenecks around. We didn't have the best wire position, so I actually ended up taking an end snare here, a little tulip snare, uh, and actually dragging that stent out. You can see I was finally able to capture it. I get it into my guide. I'm kind of pulling, 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 and finally the stent snaps three. We were then able to take a wire back down, really pre-dilate those side strengths, get a nice one-to-one -one size stent in, and get a pretty good angiographic result. Here's a second case where another partner, um, and, and normally they're my complications, but they randomly are my partners in, in this talk, um, was doing an osteal RCA and he didn't have the best guide position. And the stent had kind of worked itself back, but he went ahead and deployed. And unfortunately, he says he thinks he's probably four or five millimeters outside the coronary os. Um, he was not able to really re-engage, but wasn't able to really deploy the stent well. Um, he said, be, because the balloon kind of was working its way back as well. Apparently, this was really bad guide position. I was not able to re-engage re with a variety of uh, guides either. So we looked at the left side, and clearly there's still a problem with the RCA because there's really brisk left or rights. So I ended up uh, utilizing that going retrograde with a microcatheter um, Xion Black and then taking a workhorse up to the stent and a gladius outside into the root, followed by my microcatheter, then externalized an R350 by snaring it with a JR4 and the brachiocephalic, using that externalized wire to rail in a JR4, finally get guide position by using that externalized wire, was able to get gear in, post dilate that stent, do a little bit of distal work because uh, we hadn't actually gotten the culprit lesion because of coming back, and we're able to get a pretty good angiographic result. So in conclusion, stent loss in the coronaries during PCI is thankfully pretty rare, but can have significant consequences as we spoke about. Recognizing some of the procedural anatomic risks is key in order to avoid this. If it does occur, there's several algorithms out there and it all really boils down to whether you have wire or not. Uh, thank you guys very much for your time.